Welcome, I am Abdesh Kumar Mishra and today I am going to talk about language and grammar. As we have learnt in other lessons that a native speaker of a language has implicit knowledge of mother tongue. Every human being has innate inborn capacity to learn language, not a particular language and we all have knowledge of principles and parameters that also we learnt that that is how a child learns or acquires her mother tongue when she is young. So only thing that the child has to do, she has to get some input which she gets from her parents and others in the family and then this language acquisition device which has parameters and principles gets activated and the child starts acquiring language. This we have already learnt. But what happens in practice actually in classroom is that the teachers when they teach second language, they think that by teaching grammar language can be taught to them. But that is not right because grammar learning is not language learning. Examining irregular forms, making rules and teaching complex facts about the target language is not language teaching. Children do not simply imitate adults, utterances such as I broke it, my friend did not went, which have not been copied from adults demonstrate that the child is operating their own system of linguistic rules, which they devise and modify as they get older. So, you can see in these two sentences, I broke it and my friend did not went. So, this is guided by some rules in English as we learn that in English, the past tense is marked by ed when we write or when we, spoke, when we speak, then the d or t sound is there. So, broked, broked, looked, etc. And similarly, in my friend did not went. So, the children know that the past tense has to have went, gone, ate, drank, learnt, etc. So, it is natural that they will say my friend did not went and when they get older then they correct this mistake and they start using the correct forms. The development of these rules is an unconscious process. It is pointless to try to teach children about grammar. As I mentioned that the grammar of their native language, the blueprint of that is already there in the mind of the child. So now only she has to learn the parameters, the principles are there that how English language functions if English is her mother tongue or how Hindi works if Hindi is her mother tongue. The rules are there, the principles are there, a set of principles and as she grows, she learns that which parameters will fit to those principles. For example, uh, every child who speaks Hindi knows that in Hindi, subject comes first, then we have the object and then verb. Whereas, in English, we have subject, then verb and then object. So, in Hindi, we would say, maine aam khaya, subject, aam is object, khaya is verb. In English, I ate a mango. So, subject I, then ate, verb and a mango is the object. So, this is the order. Now, only thing that we have to do is that we have to teach the child if we are teaching a Hindi speaking child English that she has to learn which parameters will fit uh, if she is learning the English language. So, the rules are same subject, verb, object, subject, object, verb. Only thing is she has to change the order that she has to learn. Language itself is an abstract system and while attempting to define or talk about a noun, verb, case or tense etc we make it more abstract that should be avoided. It is true that children learn by using patterns rather than logic, but pattern practice alone is not enough. It should exist within comprehensible context. We should devise a system of grammatical explanation that would be more real to the students because it would follow the type of grammar that they already have unconsciously in their minds before they start learning a second language at the age of around 5 or 6. Children already have a rich system of linguistic knowledge. 
which they bring to the task of first language learning. So they already have mastered the language structure that they have in their mother tongue. In other words, while children's acquisition of the specific language that is spoken by their parents and others in their social setting requires input in that language, the acquisition task is possible because of children's built-in capacity. Grammar is inside the mind and it is a system of knowledge. It is not a set of rules or structures to be memorized or learnt as habits. It is an active system built up by the mind for dealing with all the sentences that it hears. Rather than teaching particular grammatical points in isolation, you should raise the student's consciousness of grammar in general. The teaching of grammar does not necessarily help students to use the language. It is because language is used to perform certain functions, for example, introducing, suggesting, apologizing, expressing likes and dislikes and so on. When presenting a structure, it is essential to show the meaning and usage of the structure and show how the structure is formed. Students should be made aware of why they are practicing particular structures. For example, modal verbs in English are not learned as useful structures, but rather as language tools for expressing permission, possibility, etc. It is not useful to develop activities for teaching grammar based only on the texts from the prescribed textbooks. You can also bring authentic materials or texts from newspapers, magazines, cartoon, etc. and use the same for teaching a grammar point. So, given whatever I have said earlier, we, uh, we can give some suggestions how it can be done. So, you can select a situation or a context and then relate it to a particular point of grammar. For example, follow a recipe for making vegetable curry or a sweet dish, say gulab jamun. So, instructions from a packet of noodles or soup powder to make noodles or soup and this will help you teach imperative verb form in English, present continuous tense, etc. Another situation can be give directions to another person to get to the post office or a bank using a map and this will give you chance to talk about present tense, non-referential or dummy subject like it and there as in it rains, there was a man, etc. Next thing you can use will be discuss plans for a class field trip to the science park or to the zoo and this will give you chance to talk about future tense, if clauses, conditional tense and so on. If you describe a past vacation, weekend, etc., then you can talk about grammar topics like simple past tense, question formation, forms of verb to do, word order, in negation and so on. Similarly, if you select role play, a shopping trip to buy a pair of shoes or a gift for a friend's birthday, then you talk about use of can, may, might collective nouns and quantifiers, indirect objects, etc. If you ask them to tell about their friend how to find an object in their rooms, then you are going to talk about locative prepositions, modal verbs, for example, can, may, should, etc. Similarly, if you ask them to make a daily weather report, then you will be talking about non-referential or dummy subject again and forms of verb to be idiomatic expressions because in weather there are certain expressions which are idiomatic. The medium of grammar teaching can be either the target language that is second language or the mother tongue or the first language. You can use both the language. In the long run using the target language is better. Using mother tongue or first language is helpful for a short time. Using the target language to teach grammar develops students target language, thinking and other skills at the same. However, it does not mean we would not use the mother tongue or the first language at all. We need to be flexible. Grammar teaching can be either systematic or planned or both. According to Krashen, unplanned grammar teaching is more efficient. Systematic teaching of grammatical rules is not helpful in acquiring the language. Planned teaching 
cannot include everything. So, if you have planned teaching of grammar only, then you will miss something. Engaging in unplanned grammar teaching can make students focus on the point being discussed. Language as we know is rich and versatile. Grammar items can appear at any time and in any text. It is not necessary that your text will be graded so that the one particular grammar topic comes in one lesson and another particular topic comes in the next lesson. Unplanned teaching can catch up with the rich and versatile use of grammar. Unplanned teaching can develop students habit of asking questions about the language continuously. Then let us talk about deductive and inductive type of grammar teaching and learning. Deductive learning is an approach to grammar teaching in which students are taught rules first and then they try to apply the rules to practice an actual use of the language. Inductive learning is the opposite. In this approach, grammar rules are not taught first but are left for students to discover or induce rules from their experience of using the language. Both approaches have their advantages and limitations. Deductive learning is systematic and covers more grammar in a, in a short period of time, but it may put learners in a passive position. Students are only listeners and have no control over what they are learning. Inductive learning encourages students to use their thinking. It takes a lot of time for students to work out a grammar rule through discovery learning. So, which one we should use depends on the situation in practical teaching. It is recommended to use both in teaching. When taught deductively, grammar practice can make students become very active learners by thinking about and working on the grammar. Inductive grammar practice also provides students with the steps to learn grammar through discovery. We can improve our grammar instruction by teaching grammar in context. Language teaching should aim at developing students communicative competence, preparing them for real life communication in the target language. So, they do not only have to learn grammar, learn a language passively, but actually we have to teach them to use the language in communication. They have to become communicatively competent. Therefore, offering grammar knowledge should not be the only content of our teaching. We should focus on acquiring language through meaningful use. Approaching grammar through context would create a meaningful environment for students, which would help make grammar instruction both effective and beneficial. Presenting and practicing grammar points in context facilitates the acquisition of the target language. According to Krashen, grammatical structures can be internalized if learners are situated in a particular context in which they use the structures for communication. Contextualizing grammar instruction provides many advantages. Number 1. Presenting grammatical structures through authentic text rather than isolated sentences enables students to see how a particular structure functions in authentic situations in real life situations. The adapted authentic test is also a good source of practice material. It offers students an ideal context for practicing the grammar item and brings the practice closer to real life communication. Approaching grammar from context can effectively arouse students interest. Meaningful texts instead of artificial sentences are used to present the grammar point. Also, Students are required to actively use the particular grammar knowledge to express their personal experience, to socialize and to communicate. That is why teaching grammar in communicative context is very useful. Now let us see how what I have said can be seen in a practical lesson, how you can plan a grammar teaching. So I have taken this exercise from uh, for teaching the passive voice, the material is from a book called Honeydew by NCRT and this is the second lesson. So, our aims are students will review the passive voice by exploring its use in the authentic texts. Students will practice passive oral production skills in the context of ta talking about the damage caused by a hurricane. Students will contextualize the use of the passive 
by producing a short passage about the rebuilding of the hurricane stricken area. Procedures will be stage 1 for warm up introduce the lesson by raising the question to the whole class. For example, after a violent tsunami what can be done to help the victims? Brainstorm to generate ideas. You can explore what they already know about it or what questions they have in mind about tsunami. Stage 2 will be listening. Tell students that they will listen to a portion of a news report. It can be recorded from television or radio or in the teacher's voice that is your own voice in mobile etc. about how to help children in the tsunami stricken area in India. Ask them to write down some expressions concerning the help that needs to be offered to the victims as they listen for the first time. Then call on two students to read out the expressions. Now turn students attention to the specific grammar point to be studied that is the passive voice. Give out a worksheet which will include listen to the material and fill in the blanks. Have students fill out the blanks with passive structures as they listen for the second time. Now replay the report to verify the correctness of the students answers. Have students work in groups to study their answers and quickly discuss the forms of the passive voice in different tenses. Now call on two group representatives to report the results of the discussions to the class. And finally give a summary and then have a brief revision of the passive form for which you can use various exercises based on active and passive constructions. Stage 3 reading. Now hand out another worksheet which will can include script of news report and have students fast read the report for just set the task what is the report about. Second get the answer from students then have students underline all the passive sentences in the text and now ask students to look closely at these sentences and have a group discussion about the meaning and use of the passive structure. You can display the discussion questions on the blackboard or whiteboard or on an overhead projector if you have. Why does the author use the passive voice in these sentences? These could be the sentences questions to ask them. Why does the author use the passive voice in these sentences? Could we replace the passive with the active in the sentences? What will be the sentences be like if we make the change? Are there any changes in meaning and so on. Now have two or three group representatives report the results of the discussions to the class and give feedback. Finally give a summary of the meaning and use of the passive voice. Next stage, stage 4 will be speaking. Display the photographs taken in the disaster area say in Andaman where the tsunami came from the book or from an old newspaper or from an old magazine. Invite the students to describe the photograph by using as many passive sentences as possible. Correct some common mistakes in a student's description. Next have another group discussion. Ask students to give advice on how to rebuild the earthquake or hurricane stricken area. They should focus on using the passive voice to make suggestions. This activity is used as a pre-writing stimulus activity. And so next stage will be writing. You can give them writing assignment based on what they have already done. Ask students to write a short passage say of about 100 words on the rebuilding of the earthquake or hurricane stricken area based on their previous discussions. Encourage them to exploit the passive structure in their writings when it is appropriate. So today we learnt about how language and grammar are related. We discussed that grammar teaching is not language teaching and by teaching or learning grammar language cannot be taught or learned especially a second language. We also discussed that the children when they come to school 
and they attend second language learning classes by that time they have already mastered their own mother tongue and for which they have an inbuilt capacity an inborn capacity which is named as language acquisition device which includes some principles a set of rules and also parameters what will fit in each rule and when they listen to their parents and others they get input and they uh, set their parameters against those principles. So, when these children come to classroom for learning second language you do not have to start teaching grammar to them because they already know the principles how grammar works they know what is noun what is verb what is case what is tense what is mood in their mother tongue. So, you do not have to again teach them these things and often it is very difficult also to teach in another language about these categories because language itself is abstract and these terms which are not actually language we use these terms to describe language. So, by that you are going to make it more abstract. Then we also talked about that grammar can be taught in both deductive and inductive ways and you can apply both depending on the situation. You can also use mother tongue while teaching the second language grammar. We also discussed that grammar has to be taught in context because language is rich and versatile. No native speaker uses only words or only one sentence. The moment one sentence is there or a paragraph is there, a discourse is there, the whole grammar will be there. So, you cannot separate that this word or this sentence can be taught, can be used for this aspect of grammar and the other for another aspect. So, these were the things that we learned today and finally, I would also remind you that in our minds the grammar and dictionaries are not separate, they are together. That means, language exists as a whole, you cannot really separate the knowledge of words, vocabulary and grammar rules, they all work together, all the brain areas in brain they work together and then we are able to produce language when we speak and we also comprehend language when we listen to someone. But in reality when we print a grammar and a dictionary then they are two separate things and that leads teacher to believe that grammar has to be taught separately as rules and dictionary which contains words that has to be taught separately. But actually the two have to work together that is why we have to use grammar, we have to teach and learn grammar in real life situations, in comprehensible contexts and for that we discussed how a lesson from a textbook can be used. Then we also talked about it is not necessary that we always use a textbook to teach grammar. The questions do not have to be based on the lesson in a particular textbook. We can bring other materials as I mentioned from newspapers, from magazines, it can be from radio, television, any such material from cartoons and then that can be used for teaching learning grammar. That is all for today, thank you.